What is up, Rad Potential YouTube? Welcome to today's video. It's been a while since we put a video up. Like a week. Mainly, had to go home, be with the family. My grandfather passed away last week, so... Sucks. Part of life. But, fortunately, when I was up there, I was able to get some things to remember him by. He was a farmer. Tools. Always something. And when he used to work at a Chevy dealership, back in the day, like, probably the late 50s, or early 60s, he would always mark all of his tools with these four grinder marks like this. So, he had given me a long time ago, um, a little quarter inch drive SNK ratchet, and then, you know, he's got a ton of tools, so I was able to find a half inch drive and a three inch drive to go with it. Something to live on in my toolbox, since, you know, we're down here, not on the family farm, but, uh, I'll have put some pictures in of, he did tractors. I didn't have a big use for tractors, but I had a use for cars. So the knowledge is still applied, still the same. And we're going to miss him, but he's here as always with us. Now, we are going to be working on porting this rotary engine today, among other things. And we'll just do, before we get into the porting stuff, let me just show you what's been going on behind the scenes, because y'all don't get to see... The Rad Ranch in the daylight, so we'll give you a quick little spin around. There's a bulldozer here, or I guess a high lift technically, a tract floater, but largely looks like a bulldozer. Bulldozer here. I'm getting ready to do some earthwork down there, where all the cars are at. So you can foresee potentially what's probably going to happen from that earthwork. Small building, hopefully much bigger building. Cars have been coming and moving and, and going and shaking. So I've been driving my CJ7, which I've got to rebuild the carburetor on it once because some days it likes to idle, some days it doesn't. Corvette's doing good. We've got tires coming for the RX-8, new brake pads coming for the RX-8. Justin's got his head going to the machine shop for the M3 so we can get this one put back together so that it can go to the track when the RX-8 goes to the track, but the RX-8's going to the track mid-July. The M3 is going to the track with the RX-8 at Barber in September. This car, the 99 car, is probably going to be leaving soon. Not because I'm selling it, but because it's going to my buddy Keith, whom you met. And he's going to be doing some custom concocting on this chassis so that we can revitalize it. Combining the white car that was here, the BMW E30, plus this, plus some Camaro parts, will make a lemons car. You guys can jump to conclusions as to what power plant and how that thing would be set up. But Lemons Car, first gen, it's going to be sick. Anyways, porting. Let's go over this a little bit. So I've done a video a while back. I'll link it up in the top. Um, building a Series 5 Turbo 2 for an FC. And I did basically, I don't want to call it my port, but something I like to do as far as the ports or have really like kind of created that's different from a lot of people. It's not common, basically is we're going to do a half half bridge and what that means is i'm only going to do this much of that bridge port so i'm going to shade this in so you can see it just easily so this is a pineapple racing template bridge port template for an rew this is an rew engine you use the dowels to center it on the iron and this is effectively all of that bridge I'm going to do. So half. And then we're only bridge porting the secondary plates. So the front and rear iron. Now, you might ask, why not do a full half bridge? Why not do a gnarly bridge? Well, on a turbo rotary, you can make up the horsepower that a port gets you with boost. It's super easy. And also way safer way easier on the engine you don't have to tear it apart you can just run a stock block rew with a big turbo makes a lot of horsepower and doing a port with the same turbo doesn't necessarily get you that much more horsepower right on an na engine right big valves big intake ports big exhaust super high flowy stuff helps make peak horsepower numbers higher but it also takes away from your drivability. So with this baby port here, and then a big street port on the primaries, you keep that bottom end drivability 
that an FD will have. And an FD, we're keeping the stock throttle body, right? So you get that staged throttle body where the primary is just the bottom barrel, the secondary is the top. So your, your first 20% throttle is all just this baby thing opening. It's not actually full rip. But you get to keep that drivability. And this port, right, is enough to create a little bit of extra overlap, right? And pulling the port back, you're allowing the exhaust and intake to be open at the same time. Creating that overlap so you have that nice little stoplight presence. And you don't want to, you know, full half, full bridge, half bridge. They idle pretty gnarly and it gets kind of hard to drive. But this is a very good balance of brappy at a stoplight, 1300, 1400 RPM. But not like, you know, the full bridge port stuff where you're at 15, 1600 RPM and it's just, bah, 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 bah. you know, and then your AC kicks on, it bogs it down, this, that, and the other, and, and whatever. So, trying to minimize that, but we still want it to brap. So, let's go through a quick rundown of my porting process, and then I'll start doing it, and we'll see how far we get in this video, because we're definitely not going to get all the ports done in this video, but I want to get this front iron done, because there's another issue with this front iron that we're going to have to fix, and that'll be in the next video, and I'll show you guys it here. There's a lot of corrosion in this water jacket, and it's not through the coolant seal groove yet, but it's getting there. So we're going to patch it up and fix it, and I'll show you guys how I'm fixing that. It's really not that crazy, but we'll show you the finished product in the next video. So, porting. We need to wipe this down with some brake cleaner. I'm going to haze it with some yellow paint. I'm going to score out the limits of the port with a scribe or a pick. Then I'm going to Gorilla Tape, nice, thick, hard to chew through tape, the ex excess rest of this area. We're going to get all my flashlights set up. I get my mask on, my safety glasses on, and get out my tools to start porting this. Now, you can be as aggressive as you want to be when you do this stuff. I've got a set of carbide bits. We'll use the smaller, this guy, carbide bit for now. The other thing, and this might be controversial, and I'd like to see it in the comments below while we're in the beginning of this rambling video here, me talking. So I'm going to use my my die grinder, air grinder. I also have a Dremel that I like to use right here. Quality Dremel, tons of stones, tons of bits. Now, here's the controversial part, okay? And I've asked all my rotary friends about this, and uh, this is my opinion, okay? And why I don't do this. You're gonna see a lot of people, when they port a rotary engine, take the time to go through and smooth off all the casting marks down the port, okay? On the sides of the port, up in here, and everything. You will not see me do that. Reason being, if you look at the characteristics of airflow, okay? Air flowing down a smooth, walled surface, right, is going to stick to it, and you're going to have cohesion. Air flowing down a rough surface is going to create a turbulent boundary at that interface, right, peaks and valleys and stuff, and then the main channel of airflow will be able to flow faster, right? So, so that's why a golf ball has dimples. That's why you don't play golf with a smooth golf ball. And you've, you've seen people, like the, the Booster Boys guys, there's that one guy with that NA Honda engine that he dimpled his head. He like hand dimpled the head all the way through and the intake manifold and makes like 400 wheel NA. So you're not going to see me spend the time to shave out the casting marks because the casting marks provide that turbulent boundary. And a lot of the guys I talk to that do do that, make that smooth and pretty and polish it because it looks really nice. And when you're advertising your porting and, and wanting to build engines and you take a picture of it, you know, and you see this nice, perfectly smooth, sexy ported area, it, it, it pictures really well, it really does. But there's a, uh, how much time do you spend doing that, right? Extra hour, two hours probably, smoothing that runner out four times, so eight hours of time and I don't know what they're charging for their port work, but that's a lot of extra time for 
minimal horsepower gains and it just to look nice so that's my thoughts Com drop your comment below what you what why or what or how it, it, it does and if you if you can show me somewhere i'd love to see it a dyno comparison of a non-smooth port and then a smooth port exact same setup and it's five to ten percent better than it might be worth the effort to do that but i'm still a firm believer that the the casting the roughness is the best way to be for this area so let's get to it i'm gonna haze this up scribe it in get the dremel going i've got a practice iron down here that i always keep handy because you never want to go in cold on an iron you want to put in your engine you always want to warm up on something that's junk that way you can get the feel for the firmness of the metal and how the how the tools biting and this that and the other at least i do that i don't do porting often enough to be like a super pro at it so i'm gonna bust the, cat, the practice iron out port on that a little bit and then we'll jump up here and and work this pineapple port in and see how it comes out so let's get cracking My dudes, check this out. I guess I'll turn my light back on for you. Look at that baby little bridge port in there. Okay, so the main port matched up to the pineapple racing to the T. No big issues here. I had to get a little creative with the half bridge, which is not abnormal and my kind of recipe for doing it on the turbo tune block is about the same for this so a couple things to note the pineapple racing template for the bridge gets very close to the coolant passageway and by very close i mean less than a millimeter now it's not in a compression zone of the engine you're just going to see suction here I don't think that this edge of the iron would necessarily crack like they tend to do down here, which this one, you can see, is corroded. And upon measuring, and upon measuring the thickness of the outer coolant groove into the water jacket, that comes to be about 1.5 millimeters. And that is a, if you come and check, like this is one of the really bad bridge port from Richard's engine. I did not do this, by the way. A little bit over 1.5 millimeters you go check and mainly the front irons the front irons are the thin ones so that's where you got to look out and there's another rew plate up here front plate which i had out yesterday about 1.5 millimeters so i'm pretty confident that if maz is okay with 1.5 millimeters of spacing from a coolant seal that we will be okay so what i did is i took my caliper and i went 1.5 millimeters from the coolant seal forward now here's where this gets tricky and where the REW isn't entirely like the T2 in such that the housing overlap, and, and maybe it varies from engine to engine, but I didn't feel like the housing overlapped it as much on the T2 as it did on this. So when I'm talking about housing overlap, what that means, and it's not overlap in a sense of the port, it's literally just overlap in a sense of, oh, this housing's backwards. Flip it over. Put some dowels in here. There. And there. What I'm talking about housing overlap is the housing actually overlaps further than that 1.5 millimeters that your that I am allowing between the coolant seal and the port itself, okay? So you can see the port actually comes back behind the housing and there's an open edge. Now, this engine, way close to the coolant groove, the really bad port. Now, on the housings, 
for that engine, the other half Bridgeport engine, they actually notched the housing right here, okay, and ported the housing back so the edge of the housing is now chamfered, okay, and that chamfered edge allows for that port to be more open, right? And you've seen like all the crazy pictures of the IMSA cars and this, that, and the other with the J ports and the, the weird one with the ridge through it and a lot of stuff. Anyways, but you, there's a little bit of overlap there. I'm not going to port the housing. I don't think, like I said, this is a turbo engine. We're not going maximum craziness for for uh in a horsepower right in my mind for this setup boost horsepower we want a little bit of a brap but we don't want it to be undrivable that this slight bit of overlap there is not worth the risk okay of cutting the housing apex seal catching on it the apex seal corner which we'll put those on the inside in this engine so a two-piece apex seal has a tiny corner piece that goes in it when you do a half bridge like this or a gnarly bridge like that you want to make sure that the corner the two-piece part when you assemble it you glue them together and you put those on the primary ports where the bridge port isn't it just reduces the risk of them falling out also reduces the risk of them catching on that little groove so that is where I am going to end up with this and I, I'm very happy with this port guys it, it's it does take a good bit of patience it does take I won't even say a good bit of practice it really just takes patience guys once you cut too far you've cut too far you've got to get a new iron and that's where I just like to be super careful and honestly 1.5 millimeters is a little bit too close for my liking anyways i kind of would have liked to have been able to keep it a little bit further out but i mean i'm telling you guys if you look at where the pineapple one sits i mean my little baby bridge port sits inboard of where the pineapple one is so oh come on So if you look in here, you can see that I've left some material from where the pineapple port is. And here, I'll even, we'll just sharpie this in real quick and show you. I mean, I'm not a super expert, but I can tell you that that black sharpie mark that you see there is way closer than my little Bridgeport eyebrow is to that coolant jacking port. And that's a risk that you have to be willing to make if you're going to do the porting and what ports you choose. You know, is it a high risk area where you're going to see a lot of boost pressure or anything in this area where that edge could break off? If you're running a ton of horsepower, yeah. Lots of boost. It might break. Maybe it won't. I don't, I can't confirm or deny. I, I don't have a ton of experience with porting this super close. Easy drill. With porting this super close to the coolant jacket, you know, and what the risks, the inherent risks are. I've never had one fail because I've always tried to maintain a good gap here between the coolant jacket and that. And like I said, 1.5 millimeters. I mean, that bridge port is 1.2 millimeters, 1.5. The port's nice and clean through here. So, and where the biggest difference is made, really, you're going to see in this porting template is the center iron, which I'll show you, which we'll do when I get done in the next video. But if you look at the center iron's ports, okay, look at how small your primary port is. This is, FDs are super smooth, easy to drive, good to go. Look at how big, I don't have dowels with me, but look at how big the pineapple port is compared to the stock port. You're pulling that back a ton, that out a ton, and there's a lot of meat here you know, to pull this back. So you're gonna get a little bit of that extra brap from pulling this port back as well and creating that additional overlap. So hopefully you guys learned something. Um, I really didn't wanna force a video out last week with, with having to go up to, to be a farmer for the weekend. And 
and uh, pay tribute to my grandpa and, and hang out with his friends and hang out with my family. And it was rough. You know, he was a big inspiration. But I didn't want to just crank out a video for you guys without it having substance. I really need to get this engine done and get moved on to the next bit. Like I said, RX-8 is going to the track in two weeks. And uh, we really need to be prepped for that. So, like I said, this is going to be this port done. I'd love to see your comments below, guys. There's a lot of people out there that have done a lot more porting than me. And I'm here to learn just as much as you guys are. I want to get better at this. I want to understand everything about this and, and why, you know, people do what they do. And I've done a lot of research myself and read a lot of video, <laughs> read a lot of videos, read a lot of books, watched a lot of videos, and had conversations with a lot of people about porting to get to what I know. And in reality, I've done the porting on, I don't know, six engines eight engines a lot of the engines that i've built either were a already ported just cleaned them up b stock rebuilds which is pretty common um or like i said i did the porting on so and this little half bridge port thing was something i created for my convertible and i didn't build that engine in my vert the six port half bridge which has this port here but without this bridge it's just bridge port on the top. And my buddy Ernie, and sorry, this is rambling on about porting. My buddy Ernie up in uh, FA Lynx Performance, super cool dude. And uh, if you need work done on your rotary car and you're in St. Louis area, go check him out. Awesome guy. He built a half half bridge port. We'll call it an aux port bridge. So auxiliary port bridge on his RX 8. And I think he made over 200 horsepower. Uh, or right at it. I need to confirm the numbers, but I know he's made that is his highest horsepower in a RX-8 and the best part about that port and it's why I, I mean I dreamt it up for my S5 in a car is I kept this fifth and sixth port actuators working on my car and man did it come on super strong on the top end it I think my car made like 170 wheel S5 in a in a vert and there's a video about it on the channel somewhere I mean that car ripped before I turboed it and then unturboed it and the whole mess of stuff so, but yeah, there's a balance between porting, drivability, what you're willing to risk inside your engine of it breaking. Um, I mean, you're not going to see any excessive wear from this. You can make this bridge thinner if you want. You can take more out from the bottom if you want. I, I tend to think that I'd rather have the irons be strong and stout. So that's kind of why this is a very, you know, wimpy little port, but it is what it is. This setup on that turbo tube, brapped really nice. And the guy I'm building this engine for, this REW, loved the way that that car sounded. So we're just going to replicate it. And however this car comes together with this little baby bridge, Richard for the brand new engine right here wants to do a similar setup. Um, if not a bigger half bridge like what he had in his other engine. So we'll be tearing apart a brand new Mazda engine to do this port as well. So let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Stoked. Be back to work uploading videos and such, and uh, and yeah, I'm excited. Port work's super fun, breathing in metal dust, studying the edges of these lines, and being an artiste. So, with that, guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Keep it rad. I have no idea where the dog oh, hey, there's the dog, Laddie. Come here, come here, come here. Come here. Come here. Come on. I know you're so comfortable out there. Man, you're really comfortable out there. You don't even want to get up. No? I'm going to shine a flashlight on her. Prove to her she's here. Dog life. Look at the dog. Poor dog. Sitting on her little pillow. She's been, this weekend, she's chasing us around on the farm all weekend and she is wore out wore out so peace guys